Hello, good evening. Welcome to North Lancashire Live, and it's the first in our series of online digital hustings. Um, and hopefully it's our first time doing it tonight, so hopefully it all goes well. And we have four guests on tonight. There is a change up to the lineup. Um, Neil Gray of the SNP has cancelled, um, so he'll no longer be taking part in uh, tonight's show. Although we do have filling in, uh, not filling in for him, uh, from another party, uh, is John Stanley from the All for Unity party. And we also have Don Allen from the Scottish Lib Dems. Paddy Hogg from the Saving Scotland Party and Daniel Lamb from the Scottish Communist Party. So it looks like it's going to be a really good show tonight. We're going to cover a lot of subjects. If you have a question that you haven't submitted already to the show, you can comment. We will try and get to those questions when we get to the end of the show and we have a look at them um, and we can ask the guests. And obviously, as always, please uh, be respectful to these people. They've given up their time to come on our show and talk to us. So um, to people watching, please keep it clean. Uh, and I would say the same as well to our guests. Hello. Hello there. Hi. Yo. Hi. Mark, hi up. We picked it in order beforehand where we're going to all go through our introductory um, little bit to let people watch and know who you are. So we're going to start off with uh, John Stanley from the All for Unity Party. Hello, John. Hello there. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. And your party. Okay, so my, my background is I'm a, a medic by training, and I've worked in medicine and in politics for the past few years. And Alliance for Unity is really quite a new movement, and it's come along to encourage tactical voting, really, to encourage the main parties to contest the Holyrood constituencies, uh, and whereby we would then fight the the list seats instead. And that, that between the two, that would actually maximise the kind of unionist vote in Holyrood. And the objective there is to, to obviously get the SNP out of government. Okay. Oh, sorry, we've lost John there. Um, sorry, we'll just move on fairly quickly to Don Allen. Okay. Well, hi, I'm Dawn Allen. I'm the Lib Dem candidate for Uddingston and Bells Hill and third on the list for Central Scotland. Um, as a mother of three and a full-time teacher, I'm sure you will all believe me when I say that issues related to an enhanced quality of life through education is truly important to me when it comes to the future of our young people. That's just one of the myriad of reasons I'm involved here today or tonight. Um, well, that and being a passionate liberal, of course, just as many of you probably are, but you just haven't realised it yet, as is what happened to me. So having been allowed to leaflet and more recently canvas, I can honestly tell you that I have never been so proud. Well, first of the countless blisters in my feet um, through being afforded the opportunity to canvas, I have also got a head full of questions, um, almost as painful as those in my feet, the blisters in my feet which have put me um, like time and time again like, to think about these questions. And I'm more than delighted to have the good fortune to be here tonight to answer those questions on this wider platform. So thank you for having me here. And probably the most common phrase um, I hear is, well, to vote Lib Dem, it's a wasted vote. Um, and that's close behind, like, oh, we don't even know your policies. What are they? And finally, I've got to confess uh, to be mercil mercilessly teased on many occasions by friends and family and when I'm out voting with inquiries as to how sore my bottom is from all this been sitting for so long. So, well, of course, my answer to the first claim is that it most certainly is not a wasted vote. Here in Scotland, we are subjected to what feels like a lifetime of Labour doing exactly as they pleased. Um, whilst not making any real impro improvements of note. And more recently, since 2007, we've had that populist government of the SNP, whose main objective appears to have been to successfully divide Scotland. Um, and that's been at the helm of their objectives. So it honestly breaks my heart to witness the hate which, none, which now runs so deeply in our beautiful country. So to see the animosity which has become commonplace among family and friends, um, all due to their populist politics, it really has made me want to get more involved in politics and as a liberal. So I'm sorry, but such politics, 
we're never going to work for the people of this good nation and I hope from the bottom of my heart that that healing can soon begin and hopefully with a liberal government or liberal government in some form. I would also ask, I would also like to ask you to do something with me now. So just for a moment, as I assure you that a vote for Lib Dems is not a wasted vote. So just close your eyes with me and don't worry, nobody's going to rush in and steal the silverware, you're all at home. So and now I'm asking you to imagine a government with no corruption, a society with more equality and less hate, an education system with the benefit of your children at the heart of it, a healthcare system which recognises and appreciates those who tirelessly work within it and where those who need it always receive the service they require. Imagine a country where mental health is a priority and a patient can obtain the treatment they need to deal with life and prosper. Imagine a country where the taxpayer's money goes towards the needs of the taxpayer and is not wasted on dividing its citizens for their own ends. So now, please open okay. your eyes and see this is what a Lib Dem government would provide for your country. And therefore, um, we're asking, like, isn't, don't think it's wasteful, it's not. It most certainly is not. Do I have another minute? Because I've got a few more things to say. <laughs> well, don't worry, you get, you, we're going to be on for nearly an hour and a half. You'll get, you'll, you'll, okay. you'll get, you'll get things to say. Um, just want to get through the introductions fairly quickly. Just a little bit of background on the party and things like that. So uh, next up, if I could have uh, Paddy from Paddy Hogg from the Saving Scotland Party. Well, thank you, Mark, um, and thank to yourself and the staff at North Financial Live and to um, colleagues for putting themselves forward here um, into the rough and tough of politics. It's not an easy thing to do, but that was a good introduction there from Dawn. Very well done indeed. Um, I'm actually the leader of the Saving Scotland Party, but sadly we didn't get accepted by the Electoral Commission in time. So I'm standing as an independent candidate on the central Scotland region. So none of, none of the candidates here were not competing directly against each other, but the, <coughs> the policies I'll be standing on are basically those agreed by colleagues in the Saving Scotland Party and what we have focused upon, we've actually came from a grassroots movement that was opposed to and questioning the policies of lockdown. And we did this mainly from a science-based approach, believing that the NHS should not have been shut down the way it was. Um, I'm an ex psyche nurse and I've got a few friends who are doctors and nurses and they sent me a lot of information. I expected at the start of the pandemic that the Scottish government would have, would have advised people to take vitamin D in particular and vitamin C to boost their immune system with this um, virus coming towards us start of last year. I was disappointed that didn't happen. Personally, I'm actually a former member of the SNP and I'm a councillor in North Lanarkshire, so I've been involved in politics for a while and I've seen the some of the unpleasant things that can go on behind the scenes. I left the SNP for various reasons and my particular view now is as a S Scottish patriot, is that they have in many ways became corrupt. I mean, when I look back at the Labour Party many years ago, we've seen Blair taking the Labour Party to the right politically, <clears throat> which did not make people in Scotland very happy. And I mean, even the MPs and members of the Labour Party. The SNP under Alex Salmond moved into that gap, left of centre, they went into Labour's house of credibility and the SNP have never let Labour back into that. Labour lost their patch. But as far as I'm concerned now, I think the, with the hate crime bill and with other issues like even self ID of gender, I think there's a lot of people in Scotland thinking, where did these policies come from? They were never in manifestos and they're being imposed on people. So I consider the SNP government at the moment to be um, playing fast and loose with political principles, the pursuit of a former first minister, etc. some of the things going on the squandering of public money. I don't think they're living up to what the Scottish National Party should have been like if they were going to represent everyone, as Don said earlier there. We need to be um, a country where we unite our people and we all respect each other at different levels and we bring out the best in everyone. 
you know, it's like Roy Williamson's old song, Let Scotland Flourish, fantastic song, and we should be able to pull together better after the war-torn social fabric ripped by this pandemic. So I hope we can pull our society and people together and communities and business and help create a vision and a better narrative and discourse towards a better Scotland. That's my input. Thank you for that. Thanks, Paddy. And finally, but not leastly, uh, we'll go to um, Daniel Lamb of the Scottish Communist Party. Hello, Daniel. Hi there. Thank you very much for inviting me along tonight. So, I, my name is Daniel Lamb, and I'm the candidate for the Communist Party for Motherwell and Wishaw. I'm a construction worker, and um, I would just like to highlight this, uh, what the Communist Party wants to do for the area. So, for too long, the people of Motherwell and Wishaw have suffered from cuts to our public services, to the Conservatives in Westminster and the SNP in Holyrood. Wages are continuing to stagnate and working families are having to resort to using food banks just to get by. All the while, the insanely wealthy continue to reap the benefits of a system that works to their favour, though the COVID-19 crisis has plunged people further and further into poverty and hardship. The Communist Party's policies are offering an alternative to this system of private wealth over the needs of everyday people. Communists are fighting for an increase of the minimum wage to 10.40 an hour for all workers. This is to be backed by an end to pay discrimination for young workers as well. A cut to income tax on the lowest earners with 100,000 new quality council houses to be built in Scotland in the next five years. This will be funded by taxing the absolute wealthiest section of your society, the multi-millionaires and the billionaires, and increasing a corporation tax on the profits of large companies. Communists like myself are fully dedicated to fighting on the side of the workers. So it's time to give workers MSPs who share their interests and are not afraid to make the greedy profiteers cough up the cash to fund better lives for all of us. Another thing that the Communist Party wants to tackle and aim for through this election is to prompt a mass movement in our communities that, that will start with the working class. A movement that will strike back against the cuts for Westminster and Holyrood which are causing mass poverty and unemployment. Scotland needs working class voices in Holyrood to protect the interests of working class people. And for communists, every day is Poland Day. We're out there in the streets and we're out there in our communities trying to make a difference, regardless if there's an election or not. Thanks very much. Um, so it was Daniel Lamb there finishing us off there with the introductions. Now, we've split it into four categories we're going to make, start off with, uh, and then we're going to open it up to the questions that have been submitted, as well as the the questions that people are putting up during the show. So the first topic we were going to talk about was the economy. Um, and I would go to Don Allen for this one first. And I would just like to ask you, um, COVID at the moment, big thing. Mm -hmm. We're looking at going into a recession with Brexit. We're looking at a recession going in with the, the lockdown issues. Yeah. Um, what is the Lib Dems plan to recover the economy in the next parliament. Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. But coming out of COVID, I think um, it's one of the most important things we have to address now. So there are so many factors to be addressed um, and not one single one of them can be tackled without a strong and burgeoning economy. So I have no doubt that I'm not alone here when I say that I remain awake some nights uh, worrying about the future and can we realistically recover from COVID-19? It's utterly mind-boggling to think about how much it has already cost us. Billions, trillions, I don't know. And depending, I think, on what, where you get your information, if it's including PPE, furloughing, test and trace, um, and uh, which the fact that it may turn our, turn our stomachs, we know that some of our friends, um, some of the friends of Tory ministers, certainly not my friends, and the Prime Minister have benefited. And sadly, no surprises there. Um, it's kind of, it, we have to add this up and... I reckon we have to do a, and some report and some form will have to be done on this. But now, forgetting that, we're going to have to pay for that. So in addition to the cost, we have the Herculean task of rebuilding in order to pay for this. And we do have to pay for this, believe me. So you can listen to, to the others like tonight as well. I'm really interested in what they've got to say on this. 
and in the leaders debate and the leaders their rosy claims of what they're going to do for you and what they're going to give to you whilst the band in the background are playing woefully believe it if you want but what i found i don't know about you when you were watching that first leaders debate and um, were the two final questions that remained completely unanswered i was desperate to hear what they had to say about that well while they were asked on how they were going to pay for it and the they kept, they kept giving their promises and I'd like to know just what that last person or the penultimate person asked. What exactly are they planning and cutting back on in order to make good in those promises? No, no answer was the resounding reply in the debate. I wonder if that's going to continue to be the case. And I, I will definitely be waiting for an acceptable response. Um, let's see when that comes. So anyway, the Scottish Lib Dems, we put in recover we are putting recovery first. That's our um our main objective in this election. We really want to get that message across. And traditionally the Lib Dems have been the party of common sense. You know, Mum's home, she's here, um, here's the voice of reason. Like in this uproar and upheaval of stormy waters that we've got just now, that's that's where I see us. We completely recognise the value of the young people, the competent workforce. Um, that are leading us into the future and addressing the, the debts of the past, which I don't know, it's very unrealistic not to do that. This is a future that we've got ahead of us, which calls upon a proficient and motivated workforce, ready for the challenges of that fourth industrial revolution. Um, I keep hearing about it. I don't know if you're listening to the same podcast as I am. I'm worried about the fourth industrial revolution and we must be ready for the world of ai and with the fine likes of our candidate for falker austin reed already a doctor in artificial intelligence we are with no shadow of doubt the only party talking about how to prepare for this very scary future which lies ahead of us all now our manifesto clearly sets out a comprehensive plan as to how we can give scotland the most diverse business culture in europe we are actively trying to encourage women into business. And as a businesswoman myself, I've had my own businesses. I know the stress, the pain, the, the sleepless nights having your own business causes. But, and also with the aim to ensure that we are supremely attractive as a country to invest in and to work in, not only for natives of Scotland, can but I also just, for the rest of the UK. Can I just cut in and ask, so um, again, it's the, the, the question of how do you pay for all that? Do you, exactly. Do you, That's what I like to know. How the others? Yeah, but we how, have... would the, how would the Lib Dems pay for it? How would how, would they would they raise taxes? Would they cut rates or would they cut services? We have we have a very uh, as I said at the start. You know, we're, I, I consider the Lib Dems as one of the many things that attracted me, and I realised I'm such a liberal. We've got this common sense policy. We've got this common sense that I I really feel nowadays other parties lack. They've got a budget, a balanced budget, they're not going to waste stuff, but they're not going to waste taxpayers' money on dividing the population. Um, they're going to be completely transparent, as they always are. Even when it hurts, they're quite ha they're, they're, they're more than happy to be transparent. Um, if you look in their manifesto, you'll see where each part of the budget is going to go to. And, and if I can continue, I can mention a couple of these places. And where it's going to cost raising taxes, obviously, it's, it's something no government wants to do. No government in their right mind are going to say before an election, um, oh, yeah, we're going to raise the taxes, which I think is what the other parties, especially the front runners, are not willing to do. And it's it's definitely their intention because it's the only way they can pay for these uh, these absurd promises. So okay. I, ho I hope that's answered your question. Can I, can yeah. I continue? So a few other points I really, really wanted to highlight. So especially like our high streets, for years our, hand, our high streets have been like in diminish. They're facing now the most crucial crisis in their history and they need our help. So with tax cuts for them and numerous incentive schemes which the Lib Dems have set out in their manifesto, which you can see online, we will be there to support them all the way. And it's nice to see a look in Uddingston and Bothell, beautiful main streets that are still thriving with a few, a few changes. Um, my parents used to have the, the wee post office in Bothwell and I like to go, go there and there are changes but it's still a thriving high street. 
other places like ha like Hamilton, it honestly breaks my heart. And Motherwell, you just see like two late signs up, and hopefully that can change with clever <coughs> and uh, an attractive policy to attract people back. And another point I really, really want to make, young people, I work with young people, I'm a high school teacher, I have three children, as I said in my introduction, young people are our future. And as unemployment in that age group rises, the last thing we want is to demotivate them. So we are determined not to demotivate them before they even take their first step towards their careers. So with this in mind, we have our job guarantee scheme for every 16 to 24 year old in the country, which we know will not only help our country now, but it will sow the seeds for a successful and prosperous future for all. Also, we want, it's in our manifesto, we're going to support our food and drink businesses, which if you look just now, if you heard Nicola Sturgeon today, they're certainly not doing, they've been hit massively during lockdowns. Um, they need our support. What they don't need is to be shut okay. down this week. We've just, also learned the value gonna, of the I'm internet. Gonna, I'm going to finish off there because we're trying to keep it tight and get everyone to get okay. a, a, a say on the subject. Uh, Can I just mention one little thing I'd really like? <laughs> um, something else. One, uh, honestly, it'll be 10 seconds. Whether it be from pupils or students partaking in online classes and working from home, unlike the NSA, NSP, we are going to push forward with broadband rollout across Scotland. And I think we're the only, pe the only party that really has explained how we're going to do that and that we will do that. And as a teacher, I saw like farm kids, they weren't receiving internet connection. That wasn't fair, that was holding them back. That's got to stop, okay? I know I'll stop, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, try and keep it thick because we, we've, we've got four. I'm sorry, I'm here. sorry, I just and, go off, please, Dan. And I can see the other three guys there sitting politely and just listening and taking it in. <laughs> and, and thinking, I apologize. Thinking, I haven't got half an hour to talk on this subject, but right, okay. Um, it wasn't half an hour. <laughs> um, so, Paddy, how would you address? the recovery in Scotland. Um, I'll just bring you back on. You were clearing your throat there, so I cut you off. Um, okay. How, how would you bring back the economy in Scotland? What would you do to recover the economy in Scotland? Well, I would like to think that the Saving Scotland Party, um, we could make a contribution to the narrative and to the discourse that we need to go through over the next year or so to rethink where we are what problems need solved and what the outcomes and solutions are. I want to cast a light towards solutions. So if anyone wants to look on the Saving Scotland Party website, it's at um, www and it's savingscotland.org. And what you'll find there is quite a detailed picture of what's called the four pillars. And they cover basically economy, health, education, and the environment. And within the environment, we'd put food because we need the environment to produce food right but you're talking about the economy and how we solve it now who's the economy for that's the key question whose economy is it it's the scottish people's economy and what i would like to do here i don't mean to provoke the lad from the communist party it's good to see that he's here but take some socialist ideas or you can call them humanitarian or you can call them moral it depends on your perspective and you merge Adam Smith's great work, The Wealth of Nations, with his book on the theory of moral principles, and you get moral economy. And if you've got a Christian perspective in the world, as I have, and our party does have too, so we're pro-life, but at the same time, we are pro-looking after the quality of life of everyone as an, as an outcome. That means we look after the poor. And we, we get rid of homelessness and we try and get rid of poverty in Scotland. So those are the two key things. And we keep people warm. Yeah. So we look after people. We go and try and solve poverty and we solve homelessness. And we create a moral economy where we realize that small businesses are actually the heartbeat of every community. Most of them have been shut down for the last year and suffered hugely. So there's trauma everywhere that needs to be sorted. But so first and foremost on those ideas, we would want to see at least 50,000 new social houses built every year. There's far too much homelessness. And I know from, a, from my experience as being a councillor in North Lanarkshire, that we have far too many um, big portfolio 
private houses, private flats, people making money out of the poor and not giving them proper services. So we need social houses, houses built by local government, working with people like shelter, etc. And for the future, we need these houses to be like um, super thermal, efficient houses. We need better and more electricity because of the pressures we're going to get from the sort of green issues. So we need a massive boost to the housing situation, better quality, um, less stress. The council housing people treat people better than the private landlords do. So on top of that, Scotland has never really milked the potential for cheaper energy from green hydroelectricity. It was done on the highlands. We've got rivers and places everywhere. And in terms of green energy, there could be no better way than simply more hydro. Because in the long term, the last thing I want to keep seeing and hearing from my constituents is our elderly people saying, I can't really afford to ever eat or heat my property. From a moral perspective, that is an outrage. We need to lift the quality of life of our poorest people because that is the way we really should be judged. Let's treat them like family because that's the way I can treat my constituents. People should be treated as family. We should forget. I don't see anybody as class. I just see fellow human beings. Now, so. um, on that, because you're talking a lot about a lot of great things there, but would that be funded through raising taxes or changing tax bans? How would you how would you get the money together to put that? That's a good question. But um, I think the real answer to that is I would like to see people get their heads together and forget ideology, forget even someone saying I'm a better patriot than you. We need to fix problems for our fellow human beings. If anyone's seen that image from George Square um, just after Christmas time, when there was about 150 people queued up to be fed, homeless people wanting food um, in a snow blizzard. Let that be etched into the psyche and soul of this nation and those who do nothing for it or talk in rhetorical ways or will spend this to solve, solve poverty. The, just remember this, about the qualitative thing is about poverty. It isn't just getting money. People should get paid a, a damn good wage and not exploited, particularly the um, apprenticeships, etc. So we should be treating people with more respect. But at the same time, we need the communities to come together more. We need more togetherness in the sense that when we help each other, I'm blessed with really good neighbours here. And we need our communities to come closer. This last experience that we've had in the last year has traumatised people and torn the social fabric. We need to rebuild that fabric and realise whether you're wealthy or not, as long as you're not grossly exploiting of us, that we're all fellow human beings. And we need that human touch back to help heal and bring our economy up by the boots for the quality of life for everyone. Thanks very much, Paddy. And uh, we'll now go to Daniel Lamb uh, for the Scottish Communist Party. Uh, so how, how does the Scottish Communist Party obviously has a, an image uh, in terms of how they would solve the, the, the economy, but is that... Is the image that people think of when they think of the Communist Party. How are you going to solve the economy? No worries at all. Well, just the first thing that I would like to really highlight is for the Communist Party... Oh, sorry, I'm just having technical difficulty there. Sorry, I had a wee technical difficulty there. Aye. So for the Communist Party, our main concern is that any post-COVID recovery that is going to happen in Scotland and happen in Britain does no come at the expense of the workers and of the working class people who have pulled us through this pandemic. So I'm going to put it really concise. The Communist Party, we're going to increase the tax on the highest rate of income. We're going to levy a tax on the multi-millionaires and billionaires. And we're going to tackle tax avoidance by big businesses. We're going to cut military spending and we're going to scrap Trident. All these big companies that have made super profits on the back of the workers through the pandemic, we are going to be taxing them as well because the Communist Party's got one solution to this. The pandemic was no the fault of working people and it's not going to be at the working people's feet that the cost of the pandemic is made. 
know when there's multi-millionaires and billionaires out there that can affront the cost. Okay. Um, so just a, a couple of follow-ups on that, because obviously scrap and trident is not something that the Scottish Parliament has within its power to do. So I take that would be more of a UK level thing? Of course, um, I, I should highlight that as well. The Communist Party is obviously running on a national level. Um, and what we're trying to highlight here as well is that we need to be building grassroots movements in the working class outside of the main electoral politics as well. So that will be a big, massive part in a, a lot of how we properly plan a good COVID recovery. Okay, and finally, um, uh, John, I, I apologise, I cut you off earlier on just after your short introduction. Uh, so John, <laughs> John Stanley from the Alliance for Unity Party, how is your party going to fix the economy in Scotland? Okay, well, first of all, thank you for being so patient. I do need to check. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, sure. So, from my background as a medic, uh, a little bit about, uh, but a little bit of positive news as well. Um, people are talking about recovery without the most important stage, which is survival. Okay, you can't have an economic recovery without the economy surviving. So the first thing we need to do is for money that's already been sent up from Westminster that was meant to bail out businesses but has actually gone on other things, has to bail those businesses out. Because if you, you allow it to continue, a lockdown to continue, and businesses go bust, then you've got a much smaller base to recover from. And the second part of resilience is to bring this back to where it started, which is in our NHS. It's in our accidents and emergencies it's in our general practice. I'm fighting at the moment in Airdrie to make sure Monklands A&E survives. And the reason we had lockdowns originally was to make sure our NHS didn't collapse. And so you have to start your recovery there. You have to invest to make sure that your A&Es are secure, that they're solid. You need to make sure that the vaccination program is rolled out. That means UK-wide cooperation and it also means making sure that we insulate ourselves from this pandemic in the future over a year ago through the bow group i called for the borders to be shut for as long as we did not have control over the pandemic we still don't have control over the pandemic fully and we're still flying in all sorts of uh, new strains of covid be it from brazil or pakistan or wherever now these countries have got big problems no one denies that but they're not ours. And as I was keep saying, if you want to recover from COVID, you've got to survive it first. And for a lot of businesses, for a lot of companies, and for a lot of families who have burned into the savings, that's the number one question now. Um, I was going to um, ask you to come back in and explain about the NHS and paying for it, but it leads us on to the next subject that we talked about covering on the on the evening, which was the NHS in, in total. So if you don't mind, we'll just move on to that and you can cover that answer in, when we come back to you. Is that all right, John? That's fine. Yeah, no problem at all. So again, as, as John was saying, you know, the NHS has, has taken a bit of a battering during the last year. Um, so I would go first to uh, Paddy Hogg of the Save in Scotland party on what he thinks we can do to improve the NHS coming out of lockdown. Okay, um, I think the first thing we should do is make sure we learn one lesson, but it won't come from the politicians, that we never ever witness the politicisation of public health, where you've got a group like SAGE coming out with probably lots of complicated um, potential solutions and guidelines, and then politicians interpreting them getting stuck in it. I mean, I know that right at the very start, we knew very little about this virus as it was coming and we've seen stuff in the media and it was quite a fear that gripped the UK. We then find that the SAGE group formally decided that they would um, have to up the fear factor and to get compliance, right? So they told us three weeks to flatten the curve. And as, as a former psyche nurse and someone that knows the science of and things like vitamin C and vitamin D, etc., and have campaigned for let's get rid of the vitamin D deficiency in our country. I was horrified 
that the Scottish Government did not say as this pandemic was moving towards us, everyone that they knew were going to be vulnerable because the stats were showing that clearly first week of March. Boost your immune system now. Vitamin D helps with the upper respiratory tract, etc. And I'm actually really disappointed because that's the most natural way through our immune system that we protect ourselves from a virus. There's the human virome where we're used with thousands of viruses being external. There's about 100 coronaviruses. So we knew a bit about that. And as Professor Pennington said, April the 23rd, Committee at the Scottish Government, you do not get second waves from coronaviruses. Our senior virologist, someone who was, um, he wasn't for independence, so he wasn't allowed to speak. We had a dentist doing the job. I know that people have done all this stuff with their best intentions, etc. But if anyone looks at the Great Barrington Declaration, I think it was October last year, 56,000 academics and medical professionals saying end the lockdowns because they're causing as much damage, if not more, to our economy, to our people, to suicides, to all the rest of it that happened. And as soon as you've got lockdowns and you restrict the NHS, people were scared to go when they were ill. Someone needing a, even a pacemaker getting changed and they were scared to go to get, you know, the batteries, even the batteries, someone died because of that. There's so much stuff that happened when we anaesthetized the NHS. I used to work with them, you know. So my suggestion would be that there was no formal science-based analysis for lockdowns. I think politicians need to basically decide and look at the science in the Great Barrington Declaration. There's so much debate and discussion within all forms of science. And yet, in terms of public policy, we were getting one line. Everything else was misinformation. So you had hundreds of frontline doctors who actually were saving their patients and as soon as they said what it was that we were saving my patients with, they were shut down. Websites taken down, doctors being silenced. First time in the history of medicine has there ever been frontline doctors in America here as well, and people silenced as if it's all misinformation. And the misinformation Paddy, was simply information Paddy, Paddy, contradicting Paddy, big pharma's Paddy, Paddy, lies. Paddy, can, yeah. I, can I just get you to say what you want to do with the NHS? With the NHS, the NHS, I think it needs to be broadened. It's, it needs to bring in some complementary medicine, some more holistic stuff. We need to educate our GPs in the wonderful use of vitamin D. Vitamin D deficiency should become up to optimal levels. So we can simply do more functional medicine. We can ask our GPs to do blood tests for those that are vulnerable because the pattern is that Summer season is vitamin D sufficiency. No viruses affect people. Conversely, winter is when vitamin D levels are deficient. So people need to think about this. We need to educate our doctors. We don't need to educate Dr. Grimes or Dr. Helga Ryan because they're experts in this and they know the case. Vitamin D deficiency drives 80 known chronic illnesses. So we get the levels up, we're improving the quality of people's life and we're going to slowly eliminate some chronic illnesses. So I would like to see the NHS revigorated to being what Nye Bevan wanted it to be. And everyone practice the principle of do no harm. I want the NHS back to be what it's meant to be. Okay. And it's been cut too much by Westminster government. And we need more staff. Three weeks to flatten the curb. And we're just coming out of tier four lockdown. Thanks for that. Uh, so moving on, um, Daniel, um, what is the policy of the Scottish Communist Party in terms of what should be done to the NHS? Because obviously the NHS has taken a baton over the last year. No worries at all. So the Communist Party is dedicated to keeping the NHS fully funded. We are opposed to austerity and cuts and commercialisation of the NHS and we're going to reverse all these things. Another thing that we're looking to do is we need to really take into consideration the sacrifices NHS staff as well as a lot of 
um, like needed staff at the time and the NHS have taken during the COVID crisis. And the pay rise that they've been given for Westminster, the pay rise they've been given by Holyrood is just unacceptable. Trade unions have been calling for a 10% to a 15% pay rise for all these um, workers during COVID or the NHS workers. So we would, the Communist Party would like to see fair pay above inflation for the NHS. We're also looking to bring back um, dental care under the NHS as well. That's, that's fantastic. Um, so <laughs> you, you're just so succinct, Daniel. It's, it's, it's hard to, I'm looking up my notes before you, you're always finished just before we get to it. Um, Sharp, so, chatting to the point. <laughs> aye. Um, and John, come back to you on this now, because uh, you did talk about stuff that you wanted to do with the NHS in your last statement. Yeah, thanks. So I'll, I'll actually I'll actually follow up on some of what Mr. Hogg's comments have said, uh, were, which was you, you, you do start with prevention of illness, and that's really important. Vitamin D is very, very underrated in healthcare, as is iodine, actually. No one ever talks about iodine deficiency, but most of the UK is mildly iodine deficient and if you look at where COVID deaths have been lowest in the world it's actually been the coastal states of Asia but getting back to this country again it's about building resilience into the NHS we have very large numbers of nurses and doctors every year leaving for a variety of reasons we need to focus on retention schemes to keep those in the NHS we need to train a lot more people from this country to go into the uh, clinical profession, so we're not reliant on taking those uh, workers from the rest of the world. I think these are these are kind of some of the most basic points, really. Um, but I, I don't want to get too too heavy on rhetoric, really. The, the the main answer I would say to healthcare is that healthcare is for life. It's not just for COVID, to coin a phrase. And you know what we don't need is a bunch of quick fixes. The problems that are in the NHS and the reason it's struggling are many, many years in the making. And what we need is a is a much more long term plan. In terms of a pandemic response, I think we should actually have a, a kind of a fourth emergency service. Really, I think we should have um, public health as a standalone kind of agency for dealing with pandemics, very much like the Americans do with the CDC, and um, to, to really take politicians out of it. I don't think Gene Freeman's done a good job. I don't think Matt Hancock's done a good job. I think I in Wales has been a complete disaster. And uh, back last January, I actually called one thing that is very rarely used in Britain, the British-Irish Parliamentary Assembly, because we are all one common travel area. And anything that deals with uh, a human pandemic or a human communicable disease, the strategy really has to be at that level, and it has to be professional-led. And it has to be dealt with as an emergency service, really, rather than as a, a kind of political reaction, because we've seen it. It's just been a disaster. It's the countries that have had strong civil defence agencies like Singapore, like South Korea, like Taiwan. They're the ones that have got it right. The ones that have been very political, very populist, like the US, the UK and much of the European Union. That is that is very clearly the model that does not work. We can't do that again. Thanks very much. And um, now, finally, to finish us off on, on that question, uh, we'll go to Dawn of the Scottish Lib Dems. Okay, and I will try, I promise to try and stick in the time limit. But first of all, uh, of what you were all saying, very, very interesting. Absolutely shocked that anybody mentioned Barrington. Um, deniers out there, something that I don't know, find it a wee bit worrying. But anyway, I'm going to go on to Lib Dems on NHS. So, I think um, we all know the COVID pandemic has utterly exhausted our resolute and steadfast healthcare workers and it's taken its toll on the mental and physical well-being of most of us in one way or another. We fully recognise the desperate need to fix this mess. The SNP have centralised key services such as the police and that clearly didn't work. Um, while out canvassing, I've spoken to a police officer, I was shocked by it, like the venom coming out of his mouth uh, regarding the SNP and their centralisation. So anyway, back to NHS. It may have saved the, NA, uh, the SNP government a bob or two, but the price has been paid by our healthcare system. It's tireless workers and our health, and it's a cost which is too high. Yesterday, man, Mark Hancock um, 
uh, asked, well, whenever he was asked by the SNP MP Dave Dugan, um, Mark Hancock had the pleasure. I mean, Mark Hancock, come on, the guy that's like blundered through this pandemic and um, put the SNP MP like where he should be. Like it, it was embarrassing. Um, he was asked uh, where these. Like he asked, sorry, Dave Dugan, where these missing millions have gone that Westminster gave extra to our NHS. Dave Dugan, you should have shut up. You should have stopped when the going was good. Um, for goodness sake, just please cease from embarrassing yourselves further and give the NHS what you owe them. It is completely shameless. Anyway, we are almost fully aware of our need to invest in the mental health. I think the Lib Dems are fully aware. Three out of every four people yeah, suffer yeah. from mental health issues. That's and four out of every four people have mental health. So shall we be spending so we shall be spending sorry fifteen percent of our funds allocated to health on the essential area of mental health. Half of all mental health conditions start before the age of fifteen. More than one thousand five hundred kids in school are waiting for over an entire year before being allocated a specialist. That's simply not good enough. All the centralisation has done has slowed things down to a snail's pace, and we do not have time for that. This is like a European death record, because, and to quote the First Minister, she took the ball. Again, it's just not good enough. We must be there to help our citizens, and we must provide them with the services they so desperately need in the NHS. So we plan to train more mental health care specialists to work in schools, community centres and surgeries around the country. And in addition to this, we shall be doubling the amount of training centres for psychiatrists and counsellors. We will be there for them. Demotivated, underappreciated nurses and doctors is not something anyone should aspire to, nor an endless waiting list, for it's now, which are now worse than ever thanks to COVID. Yeah. And for the Scottish yeah. Lib Dems, our NHS is a major priority, not the recipient of a list of broken promises. So, in the words of Nicola Sturgeon, you know, she and SNP has dropped the ball on drug-related deaths. We want to offer medical support rather than punishment and prosecution to those fighting with addiction. We're going to be there for them. We're going to do something realistic. The Lib Dems want more preventative emphasis on health also. We want to promote a healthy diet, sport, meditation, especially for our young people. As some of the other people, it was Dan, Daniel, Paddy, they both mentioned different things. I think John too, vitamin D, iodine, all the things. It's even more basic than that. Healthy diet, or, um, or the fish supper and things, change that to a salad. That will do probably just as much good as like vitamin D, We've got to change. We've got to get healthier. Lib Dems have that look at their manifesto. They've got that in place. We have to act now. There isn't any time for delay. We are promising to de our health care system by making it easier to get a range of diagnosis and treatment in local communities rather than main hospitals. For the party that will do more for your NHS, look at our manifesto. Trust us. Remember what I said, uh, recovery first. Recovery in, all, recovery in all senses. Trust us, it's not a wasted vote. Thank you. Okay, okay. right. No. Yeah, believe me, you could cut time off by stop saying the vote thing at the end because you're going to be on for another half hour at least. Come on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that um, sort of differentiates the Scottish NHS from the other NHSs within the United Kingdom is obviously the free prescription. Now, um, just quickly going round, um, starting with Daniel, um, will is free prescription something that would stay under the Scottish Communist Party? Um, I think it would be very easy just to say I, free prescriptions is something that would stay. I simply, yeah. Yeah, no problem. And Dawn, quickly. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I remember in 1996, um, my mother was dying of cancer. We were the only people at paying for the prescriptions, and it wasn't fair. We, pay, we paid a fortune. Don't drudge a penny, obviously. Um, this is fair, uh, and that, uh, granted, is one good, really good thing the SNP did, and Paddy. it would definitely stay. Paddy, um, I don't think anyone really should question the principle that the NHS was set up 
plan I Bevan to do from cradle to the grave, and that principle of free prescription should be kept for good. And John? Yeah, um, I'll probably explain a little bit uh, while we've got a bit of time on this about where it came from. It's it, it, a time when the type of people that had prescriptions tended to be young and tended to be working. And so when prescription charges were brought in, about a third of the prescriptions carried a charge. And obviously, we've got older as generations have gone on. Our healthcare is more complex. And some of the drugs that are now available are far more expensive and far more technical than some of the ones we've had in the past. And so the, the commitment to the prescription charge is really ideological. It, it's not even as if it brings any money in. In England, I think it brings in something like 5% of the drug budget and about half a percent of the NHS, which is probably less than car parts do. And so, so I mean, I'm happy with free prescriptions, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's the great ideological achievement people think it is. About 95% of prescriptions now, even in England, um, are exempt from it. So it probably just needs to go UK wide. I think it's almost a, a kind of embarrassment that that England keeps hold of it. It doesn't really do anything. I mean, I mean, I. I... I know what you're saying about the, the economy of it. It's more the case of that is knowing North Lancashire, North Lancashire, I would say from a feeling from having spoke to many people in the political field is that that is a, a is a very important issue within North Lancashire. Um, and it was just to get your your feel for it because yeah. obviously that's one where, you know, if people said, ah, they're coming for your prescriptions, uh, I think that's that was just to get a feel. So you're all in agreement, no prescription charges. Um, now, in Scotland, uh, Scottish Parliament, there's one subject that has to be broached by any political party that is going to stand for the Scottish Parliament, and, and that subject is that on independence. Um, so we're going to go around again and get uh, why, uh, what you stand for, whether you stand for independence or a referendum or... If and if not, why not? That sort of thing. So I believe to start off, if it will be Daniel from the Scottish Communist Party to start us off on this one. So Daniel, no. is the Scottish Communist Party pro independence or pro union? Is it pro referendum or anti referendum? No. It would uh, this as a communist would like to offer you um, a different interpretation and analysis a uh, the independence uh, debate. So. The Scottish Commun Communist Party does not, um, we don't oppose that Scotland has a democratic right to have a vote on self-determination. However, we look at um, the situation for a class analysis and we would like to see that a third option be added on any ballot if there was to be another referendum. And this would be a third option for a federal structure in Britain, a, a radical federal structure of Britain. So what this would mean, it would be the devolved economic levels um, for Britain would be devolved to all the nations so that their economic needs could be um, controlled by the nations so that the people in Britain, the working people in all these nations have full control over their economy. It would be decentralising and defunding the city of London so that the wealth of Britain is more evenly shared out to all the nations who need it and also across the devolved uh, regions of England as well. And there would be an increased level of autonomy of local councils. This is the, the vision for Britain that the Communist Party wants to see. We don't want to be even engaging in the binary um, yes or no debate for a country as a union in Britain or a country as a nation in Scotland where austerity measures and cuts will still be pre placed on the back of working people. So we stand against that and instead we're looking to offer an extension of the debate and this form a radical federalism. Okay, so um, just to clarify on that, so, um, but would you stand, if it was to come forward uh, as a vote in Parliament for a, a second referendum, would you vote for it or against it or would you have to abstain? We would have to be campaigning, but well, we are campaigning right now for a third option on any potential ballots. And that would be the option for, like, I don't know if you can akin it to, like, devolution max, but um, more entwined with the economic levers to make sure that lives are actually made better 
in a material sense for working people in Britain. Okay. And next, uh, John uh, from Alliance for Unity. Um, your stance on independence? Oh, sorry. Uh, a pro-British. Can you hear me? If you can just start again, John. You were just muted there for a second. Okay. So we are a British party. Obviously, we're very proud to be British. Uh, we've had one referendum. And uh, our main concern is that um, if we have a second one, do we have a third or a fourth? And so the main policy for uh, All for Unity is to actually have something called the Clarity Act, which is from Canada, where they had similar issues with um, sort of Quebec independence for a long time. So that really just puts in place the kind of conditions that any future referendum um, would need to fulfill, and, and that's on the website. I won't go through that point by point. But um, the, the whole point is that we need to take this out of Holyrood as the kind of uh, football that it's become. The worst thing about the debate is that it creates a very lazy opposition, and it creates a very a government, and neither of them are actually very representative. I mean, we, we've talked... I think far more tonight about the NHS and other issues than Holyrood will be spend in a month. Um, which is problem of where this kind of political ping pong has taken us. So, yes, we're against a, a referendum at the moment. Yes, we are the United Kingdom. Um, but it's about just nailing this question down because a personal gripe of mine is that we have uh, the Tory Prime Minister in Westminster saying there won't be a referendum. And then we have the Scottish branch office of that party saying, vote for Ross or there'll be a referendum. And you, you, you just can't be those kind of games because you are playing with people's lives. And the oxygen you're using up talking about a referendum and whether or not it's going to happen is, is, is really a distraction from delivery and from dealing with really, really important uh, issues in our country. I hope that's I hope that's clear. Yeah, that's that's perfectly clear, and that was great. And we'll now go to Paddy, who give us the Saving Scotland Party stance on independence. Um, basically, it's I wish it was as binary as it seems in the press. Um, I think we've got a first minister that's a, a closet devolutionist who plays the pro indy camp movement, but that's my personal assessment. <clears throat> the party stance is quite simple. Um, if you're a Democrat, you believe in the first principle of international law, and that's the right to self-determination. But that should only be the case in practice if the Scottish people demand another referendum. I believe that the people in Scotland are sovereign in terms of decision making and people should accept that but in terms of analysis of the situation we're in just now how do you solve a problem unless you diagnose it properly and then solutions as prognosis how do you get from a to b right so i'm a former snp councillor and my beliefs a few years ago were definitely towards independence right and i would see the scottish government as in some actions, corrupt, um, malicious pursuit of rangers, costing the taxpayer millions, other things, ships um, not working, so, you know, rusting. There's various things that went wrong with the economy. <clears throat> and just gloss over it, move on. I don't want to see the public pound wasted in such a manner. I want to see the best for the Scottish people. So I no longer trust the Scottish government. The party no longer trusts them. I think we need a rethink on which we were going to go. If it's independence, what's it for? And independence from who and from what? So if we just simply focus on Westminster and we think Westminster's corrupt, we want to improve things here, I would say we need independence from, you know, the communities, the towns need a bit of independence from the, the power exercised over us by the Scottish government, by Westminster. They've used political power to crush some of the communities. So, and if you look from local government, there's actually three different stages of government. We've got local government, which I'm part of that as a local councillor. 
the decision making comes from the Scottish Government to us. So our officials tick the boxes and do what they have to do as professionals. But at a higher level above the Scottish Government isn't just the Westminster Government. We have the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, the World Bank and the IMF. There are laws and legislations which regulate the UN's different agendas on behalf of large corporate power. Most people don't see or think about that level. It doesn't get into the mainstream uh, Paddy, media. Paddy, Paddy, you're what I'm off, saying is, Paddy, you're getting a bit off track there. Um, I, but, but it's not actually off track. Just because it's not discussed, we should start getting this understanding that the other level it's, it's, has it's affected all, it's, us it's, and it's affecting track, our economy it's, and our future. Yeah, but it's off track on the question I was asking. <laughs> in, terms I, but, of, um, in, in terms of rethink, where are we going to go? We're going to have the UN starting to tell us through the green agenda that you might have to give up using your petrol car come 2030. So if you're looking forward and planning, where does Scotland go, right? What can Scotland do with Scotland's economy for Scotland's people? Then there are various things coming from the UN agenda and the green agenda saying we might have to give up oil production at a certain point. How are we going to heat our homes without you know, a certain amount of gas? We need a rethink. So that's what the Saving Scotland Party is saying. We need a rethink and a proper one to bring out what is the best for everyone on these islands. One little economic point, I'll just finish on this, right? 45% of our fruit and veg is grown <coughs> in UK, right? 45%. We import 55% of the fruit and veg. If there's any more blockades, if there's any more trouble with a virus or other pandemic, etc., we need more allotments when you change our farming. If you start to look at the complicated picture of what we need an independence okay, for, Paddy, if we're going to go that Paddy, route, Paddy, you know, just, we need I'm independence just, from the I'm powers just, above us. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm finish up there. And finally, um, Don, finish up there. And... Um, if you want to take us the Lib Dem, the Scottish Lib Dem stance on another referendum. Oh, can I sorry. finish off what Paddy said? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I found that really, really interesting. And I definitely um, agree with, although I disagree with a lot that Paddy said this evening, that definitely um, is something that I think we should talk about later, um, following the Dutch model, which I'm interested in following up. Now, can I start my time as from now? <laughs> so absolutely, 50% um, of the population wish to remain in the UK. Like Roughly, we don't know, but it's that 50% want independence, 50% don't. It, to me, it's a complete and utter no-brainer to chase into, like not to chase independence right now. Do you honestly believe Scotland could prosper alone right now after, after a pandemic? Seriously? Well, hello, no. I don't. I really, really don't see it. In a world where large corporations are in receipt of more and more power with respect to nations, we have to hold fast and as a strong country. As a strong country, as in United Kingdom, Scotland, as a country and the United Kingdom. In the wake of this pandemic, we're all going to be struggling and it would be deeply socially irresponsible to put our citizens in this precarious position that the SNP government are so willing to do. Mike Russell has already published a draft bill on independence. It's clear as Edinburgh Crystal that they want their referendum as soon as possible. And that worries me. That keeps me up at night. Right now, I don't think so. So, uh, just a wee bit of personal um, anecdote here. On the 26th of March, I went as instructed to Ravenscraig for my Oxford AstraZeneca jab. Female Stuart soldier from Salisbury vaccinated me. And she was telling me how it was her first time in Scotland and just how overwhelmed she was and how friendly and funny us Scots were. I actually had a tear in my eye just like being there, this vaccination and this wee story. This is what happens when we have a joint effort of the United Kingdom. People pull together and we can work wonders. We, there's very, very few differences between me and that soldier for, that came up from Salisbury to help me and give me that jab, which was created in Oxford, the United Kingdom, which we're part of, it makes us, it, it makes me proud, okay? UK is now one of the leaders within Europe, within the world, in terms of the numbers who are vaccinated. 
However, unfortunately, we do not have that four-nation approach to COVID due to our First Minister's conviction regarding doing things differently for everything related to COVID, to COVID, which quite frankly just seems to be for the sake of it to me. Nevertheless, there's this underlying problem where most, I'm going back to the question now, sorry, I drifted again. So half of the population have nationalist sentiments and these must be addressed. The Lib Dems do have a proposal and it's the way forward. And it, honestly, it's like having your cake and eating it. Federal United Kingdom. And sorry, Patrick Harvey, sorry, there's nobody from the Greens here tonight. He said, um, oh, you know, oh, that good Miller. Federal Germany uh, doesn't work. Well, listen, Patrick, it's a high time you get your statistics right. And not just sat as one of the Green Garden wing of the, the SNP. Um, federal UK, please look into what is federalism. I lived in Spain for 23 years. I witnessed firsthand how effective their regional governments were. Look at Germany. You don't get a country as efficient as Germany. So I can honestly say that I believe this is the best way. Nay, the only alternative for Scotland and the rest of the UK. Okay, so Lib Dems right now are definitely nay to independence. Right, okay, thanks for that, Don. Uh, we seem to have lost John for a second. Um, oh. Uh, oh, he's popped back. There he is. So we, we've been going on now for over an hour. So we've been on for 56 minutes as is. And as I said at the start, there will be, at the end, we were going to get to questions that people have submitted uh, as well as questions that may have arisen up on the comments. So anyone that's watching right now thinks, oh, I really want to ask a question of one of the candidates, please pop it in the comment section and hopefully we'll get it. But what we will do is we'll start with um, the, the first question that we got submitted, which is, if you were elected as an MSP and were given the opportunity, what would be the first bill that you would introduce? Um, and I'm going to go to... Uh, who did I go to first on that last one? It was Daniel, wasn't it? It was the last one. So that would make it back to John for the, the first answer for that. So I don't know if you heard that, John. Uh, I did, yeah. 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 So if you, you give us your answer on that, that'd be fantastic. Okay, well, the only way of really making progress in any um, project is to know where you are. And so the first thing I would pass is a bill for a national audit. And that would show not only um, how much of our money is spent, but where it goes, why it goes there, um, who benefits from that. And in terms of things like freedom of information requests that have been stifled, they would be opened up fully to a, a full external um, audit. Uh, any super injunctions that have been paid for by taxpayers' money or otherwise protect politicians who are judged by people based on people's opinion of them. All those super injunctions would be lifted, every single one. We'd find out what people were up to. And that's not um, about that's not about digging into people's privacy, but we need to know where we are. We need to know who is making decisions in this country. And as part of that national audit, we do have to look about the separation of powers, where it exists, and the role of the uh, Lord Advocate and how our select committees in Holyrood operate or how they don't. Because I think a lot of people get the sense that regardless of whether you want Scottish independence or not, Scotland isn't working. It's not working as well as it should do. And um, every now and again, when you've been running for a long time, and we've been running for 10 years on independence debates now, you have to stop, you have to take a breather, you have to condense, you have to look, look where and what you want to and start building, but you can't build a house on sand. Um, what I would say is, do you, do you not feel though, as well, just as we follow up on that in terms of the super injunction, do you not feel that basically super injunction is something that is just for the rich? Should there not be something for either open up <coughs> so you're able to get it if you're a poor person like myself, uh, or is it a case of where there should be a legal standard where that's not something that you can actually bring in? Oh, it's scrap them completely. There's absolutely no reason why anyone in elected office or in public service should have a super injunction. You're meant to carry the confidence of the public and have the public have confidence in you if they're not actually able to read reports that journalists have that they're banned from, they're banned from issuing. 
You know, this is a government that wants a name person scheme. It's got a hate crime bill, so it shuts you up when it wants. It has your children spy on you if it can get away with it. And the moment it comes to them, uh, the whole weight of the state is behind them. It's not just the rich. It's one that has access to power and money. And that includes people in government. That includes people at the very highest levels of government. And as you know, I can't even say more than that. Um, so if, if we now go to Don, if you were elected to Parliament what, and you were given the opportunity to bring a, a bill towards the Parliament, what would be the first bill that you would bring? Uh, sorry, I'll just, sorry, Don, I'll just bring you back up again. Sorry, what? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay. Well, as a teacher, okay, sure, sure. Right, well, as a teacher, a secondary school teacher, educationally is unendingly dear to me. And a dream come true would be what the Lib Dems um, have in their manifesto, the possibility of cutting class sizes and having one to one help for freedom. If you were to ask me um, the, idea, the ideal classroom situation, um, how we can improve our education system, it would undoubted, uh, undoubtedly be to lower our class sizes. And implementing such a policy would provide jobs for all the teachers, qualifications and um, be more pre our, our students will go out better prepared and with better with more qualifications also the other um policy regarding education which the lib dames are, are addressing and honestly it brings music to my ears is starting the formal education at the age of seven and allowing our five and six year olds to develop within a play-based learning environment uh, my best friend all three her big sister she was a primary school teacher um, she's now retired, um, and she once told me because I was I was always more about my son. Oh, primary school it was a nightmare; it was hell. Um, she told me one of the best teachers, one of the people who gave me more advice than anybody. She told me what she would do is put every boy into the playground with a ball or with some toys until they reach the age of ten. Um, psychologists have often discussed this at length, and. Um, it's only the Lib Dems who are actually taking heed of their suggestions. This play based until the age of seven, that will do me fine. Five, five to six, play based learning. Um, we'll see the benefits. We will. Scandinavian countries have done it. They're ahead of the PISA charts. Um, it's, there, it's there to look at. Okay. Um, and oh, that would be my first question. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Oh, sorry. That, that, was a, that was a minute under your time. Uh, <laughs> well, I can, can I go on? <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, again, same question uh, to you, Paddy. Um, if you could bring one bill um, to Parliament if you were an, if elected an MSP, what would it be? Uh, just hold on a second. I'll just bring your microphone back up. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Mark. Um, difficult to keep this to one because I would get getting rid of the hate crime bill and various things, or self-ID gender. I think some of these things I think, are... I think, I think uh, Paddy, to be fair, concentrate on uh, what you would bring, not what you would yep, scrap. Yep. Yeah. I want to add to just what Dawn said there, and it sounds like she's been reading the Save in Scotland website, but it's good that good ideas converge and people start to pick it up anyway, so let's say it's in the culture. Um, education policy, we thrashed out over quite a while is basically the same as what Don was saying there, kindergarten until seven. We've already got private examples of this, right? The SNP government made their main flagship policy as that of bridging the attainment gap. The attainment gap we need to bridge is that between um, public education and the best in private. Get it up to the best we can do and restart another enlightenment in Scotland. And we do that via, just, just throw out something here, the four C's, right? So that would be um, curiosity, creativity, compassion, absolutely critical for human empathy, and also critical thinking. We need more critical thinking. And if we are taking the pressure away from kids of exams and doing the kindergarten stuff until seven, you can just imagine we build curiosity. It happens every day. I'm a dad. I had the pleasure of bringing up um, twin girls, which was just paradise, wonderful, and a young son. And you learn from your children. And you 
soak information into them and music and different things. And you let them f basically flow with their creativity. And that's what we need to do. Take two examples in Scottish history, Thomas Telford, Robert Burns, both from peasant backgrounds, both of them internationally renowned. And they would basically be out in nature. We need people to go back to the Bothies, hill walking, visiting the sea. Curiosity is engendered in such beautiful places. This is where poets are made. Scotland is a nation that is so lucky to have the scenery we have. Let's take our kids back into that. So I would say that um, the group Upstart, the best start for Scotland's children is to advocate kind kindergarten, follow the four C's and that educational future will be bedded and seeding critical thinking, hopefully. And such a nation will always make our politicians much more accountable. And hopefully they'll have the right to learn to assert their democratic rights and hold on to them. And we don't see them being lost. Thanks very much. That was great. And and finally, but not last, not least, uh, Daniel from the Scottish Communist Party. Again, if you could introduce one bill, and what would it be? Your first day in Parliament. Uh, hold on, Daniel. I'll just give me a second here. Uh, we seem to have... Um, I, as well... Is as well as being a, a member of the Communist Party, I'm also a member of its uh, partnered youth organisation, the, the Young Communist League. So um, creating a dignified life for, for all workers in general to enjoy um, life as well as um, the youth is also very important being part of this organisation. So I think what I would um, be pushing for is a bill would to be um, free access for under 30s to all sports, leisure and, and cultural facilities and um, like museums and sports centres and things like that for for the youth so that we can really get out there, we can enjoy, we can exercise, we can learn sports, we can engage in, in Scottish culture, you know, I would really like to push forward that. That's fantastic. Now, um, one question that did come up as well, um, it was more aimed at pro-independence parties in terms of if Scotland was independent uh, would this would this such and such and happen? So I've rejigged it for tonight because it's it's kind of not appropriate, because um, it's asking a question that you know might not happen, could happen but might not happen for, or or, or never happen. Um, so the the question would be um, the BBC and the TV license. Is it is it time now in the age of the internet uh, and so many news outlets? Is it time for us to revisit and look at the way the BBC is funded uh, and the structure of the way it's produced? Um, so uh, I think we'll, we'll we'll start with Paddy and we'll move around clockwise from there. Um, I think I'll just shoot from the from the lip here. I think Big Brother should be basically shut down and defunded. I'm not impressed with the way that the entire mainstream media has worked in the last year. Um, I've been put in Facebook jail several times, banned off Twitter. The Westminster passed legislation so we couldn't have any discussion about science, hence the Great Barrington Declaration. I think um, they have become harlots to Big Pharma. Hope you don't get your video deleted for saying that, you know. So, I mean, where has been, where has been the discussion and debate about stuff? It's all been, oh, that's misinformation. A lot of that misinformation was coming from frontline doctors and coming from peer-reviewed science. So BBC, I'm not impressed. I would like to see more independent channels like UK Column, other groups like that. Let's have as many voices in this discourse as possible. If we're going to reforge a future, it comes from ideas first. We visualize those and then we start building and creating a better society that we all want, not one that's um, being engineered and being forced upon us. I think we should be able to choose our own society and make it ourselves. Okay, that's great. And and John um, for the Alliance for Unity, the BBC. Oh, sorry, John. Sorry, I'll bring you all back up here because we're going round the round the screen. Sorry, John. Uh, that's you back up now. Yeah, so in the last year or two, I've really changed my view on this. Um, 
I, I genuinely thought for a long time the biggest threat to free speech uh, in Britain was the BBC, and its threat. Um, this threat now is big tech. It's the very large global corporates like Facebook and Twitter. Yeah. And I mean, he, uh, Mr. Hogg has talked about being in jail with these people. Um, it won't be long before we're actually really in jail and before our social media privileges are actually taken off us. And so there is an argument. I think there is a strong argument now for the BBC to actually be taken back into full public ownership. It's not at the moment. It kind of runs off some strange uh, board of advisors. But to actually take it on board, again, audit it, take a lot of the educational brief out of it, which really has gone elsewhere. In terms of education, in terms of debate, um, I'm the grand old age of 39. I remember 25 years ago, the BBC Two was excellent in producing a lot of uh, series to do with debates and scientific uh, lectures. It slipped on that. Um, and I actually think a reinvestment BBC, focusing it on uh, on science and on debate, on critical thinking, as Ian said, and, and on skepticism, I think it's a very useful bulwark because my worry is that we end up being in over like the 1930s where you end up having one side of your Spanish Civil War going and the other side gets in and you realise actually both both sides were awful. Um, my worry is that if we collapse the BBC now, we'll actually be even more at risk of big tech completely dominating our lives uh, and our access to free speech and debate effectively outsourced to somewhere in California by people that you know, are not always the best people. That was great, and I'd just like to say, Mark Zuckerberg, please don't shut us off at midstream there. We'll, we'll, well, there you go. We'll, we'll, we'll be good. Um, <laughs> and, and, and Daniel, uh, your uh, your party's stance on um, the BBC. Um, that's, or, that's a or, or if it's hmm. a personal opinion. I think it will have to be a personal one here. I, I, we don't we don't spend a lot of time um, as Marx is discussing um, the intricacies of the BBC. I imagine, um, but I just I think the BBC needs to really be um, held accountable to to working people and really represent working people in its broadcasts and and its and its channels and its shows. Um, like like all things for Marxists, Marxists and communists, our main concern is to have the best for working people. Yeah. Fantastic. And yeah. finally, Don, um, the, 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 Lib, the Scottish Lib Dems, um, what do you think of the BBC? Is it run its course now? Does it need to change drastically? It has to change, but not drastically. Um, definitely for over 75s at conference last year, it was Daisy Cooper put over um, a motion, and it was how that charging over 75s could actually push them into poverty. Um, so definitely for over 75s, it's got to be free. Um, as a teacher, and I told you I worked at, I, I lived and worked in Madrid for 23 years, um, I, I watched the BBC every day and I wouldn't mind paying, I really, really didn't mind paying for a subscription to the BBC. It, it provides something that nobody else does, so I don't mind paying for it personally. Um, and I don't think, like the Lib Dems, disagree with people who can afford it to actually pay but i think it should be maybe relative to what you earn or we should pay something all good like you know we know that old saying um nothing what is it nothing free nothing if it's free i can't remember that saying if it's free it's not good uh, nothing if it's free be suspicious can't remember anyway um on the other hand you know bbc they cover they covered up for people at jimmy savile so i like you've got that dilemma and um, the BBC have to change their act. They have to um, be up to the job. And on one hand, like they, they are on one hand, but on the other hand, they've got things they've got to do. For pensioners, there's absolutely no way they should be paying a licence fee. Um, for those who can afford it, yeah, but the BBC have to have to do a job that that that's worth paying for. Okay, I did not think Jimmy Savile would get mentioned tonight. I just have to say that. Sorry. Before we wrap up. I can't believe it was <laughs> me that brought him up. <laughs> um, so, 
basically, we've come we've come to the end of uh, of our hustles. Hopefully, you guys uh, have enjoyed it, uh, and and hopefully, people watching have got something out of it as well. Got a bit more information uh, about what you stand for. So, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to go round again, um, and what we're going to finish off with is you you're going to get two minutes, right? Two minutes each, um, and when it hits your two minutes, I'll flash back to the screen and you get an extra 30 seconds that's it uh, and then after that I'll just mute your microphone uh, <laughs> to say to voters why they should vote for you in the upcoming election okay and and, and we'll start off with you Dawn just to finish us off okay <laughs> really <laughs> <laughs> okay so just tell us why people should vote for Scottish Lib Dems um I think people should vote for Scottish Lib Dems because they, as I said earlier on at the very, very start tonight, they're the party of common sense. Um, Mum's home, we're going to put order back in the house and they do it, they do it right. Read our, read our policies. Um, we're not right, we're not left. Lib Lab uh, Coalition actually worked. And if you look at the Lib Tory, um, Coalition, not that I'm that proud of that, but some of the things that happened, but there were good things. Um, Nick Clegg prevented a lot of awful things from happening. Um, our environment, something we didn't touch tonight that I really, really wanted to, our environmental policies, they're actually greener than the Greens. We're the, the most, the, we're the furthest forward in sustainable, um, a sustainable earth, a sustainable future with renewable energies. 2030 that's like the deadline we've got so much that we've got to got to achieve by then um but we're in this changing world just now as i mentioned earlier fourth revolution china are way ahead are way ahead than anybody we've got to be up there the usa have already lost their their place in the world we're facing china being the the, the major power we need to be ready. We need to have common sense. I'm sorry, the Labour Party is like going back to the 70s. SNP is like going back to the 40s. I, like, I know my opponent was like heavily um, criticised for mentioning the Holocaust. I'm going to mention it too. I think Hitler would be proud of the SNP right now. It's like going back to the 40s. Liberal Democrats look forward. It's a party of the future. It's a party prepared for the future. Um, vote for us and you're voting for security, common sense and a good future in the UK, in Europe and in the world. And again, I've got to say it, we're putting recovery first and that's short term. Long term, we're looking for even better things. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. Um, Paddy, yourself again, if you could just give us uh, two minutes and then after two minutes this screen will come up and that'll be your 30 second uh, and if you run over, I will cut your microphone. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, basically, I'm, I'm putting myself forward to be a candidate on the Central Scotland regional list. So I'm not asking people for your first vote. Um, but what we can offer is basically I am the leader of the, the Saving Scotland Party, and we're trying to find solutions that are non-ideological and benefit everybody in the country. And I think that's what real patriots should do if you care about your fellow man and fellow woman. Um, so basically I'm saying you don't have to like someone like me and think, right, are some of these ideas really the way forward? And I think you heard from Don, a school teacher, myself converge about the basically the four C's, kindergarten, we need to change our education system. That's one. I don't want to see our country Again, going back into lockdowns, I want to see the NHS broadened and I want to see if anything like this ever happens again, that we get the advice to up your vitamin D, protect your immune system. Um, and I don't want to hear someone saying, oh, it was an error that the old folks in the care homes died. It wasn't an error. It was a massive, disastrous mistake that led to thousands of people dying. Someone to say that's an error. These are our mums and dads, and we need a human response to these things. So I would like to see a less class-based society or any factions fighting or ideology. I want to see people in Scotland actually come together and help create a better society. And I want to see poverty 
gone. I want to see us treat each other far better. This comes not just from being a human being. It comes from being someone who believes in Christian values. I think we need to start reaching out to each other. We need to rebuild the trauma that has occurred in this country and torn the social fabric for the last year. We need to realise our small businesses are the heartbeat of our community and support them. So I think there's a lot we need to do, and I just hope we pull together and do so. Thanks for having us on, Mark, and a pleasure to discuss things with everyone that's came here. So thanks for your Okay, and um, John Stanley, uh, John Stanley of the Alliance for Unity Party, why should people vote for you? Okay, so Scotland has a, a very, very narcissistic party and government now, and it's been there for 14 years. Uh, it's not going to stop talking about the, the issues that it obsesses about. The only way to get them out is a pro-unionist majority, and the most um, sensible way of getting a pro-unionist majority is vote for all for unity on the list and then vote for any pro-UK party who is most likely to win a constituency. We are not going to get off this merry-go-round until we get the SNP out of government and that's really our platform. We need to start uh, auditing our government so we know where we are and we need to plan to move forward uh, with MSPs who come from professional backgrounds and that's most of the people in Alliance for Unity, that's GPs, that's myself as a doctor, uh, that's a former um, sheriff and uh, someone that's been in business for 30 years. We need a lot less rhetoric, uh, we need a lot more focus and we need MSPs that can answer questions that they've listened to very clearly and I hope I've done that tonight and again thank you for having me on. Uh, that was nice and concise John. And, and to finish us off, uh, a man of few words, um, uh, we'll have uh, Daniel Lamb of the Scottish Communist Party. So, Daniel, why should people vote for the Scottish Communist Party? Hey, I don't know if I should maybe go on for a good 20 minutes now, uh, just to keep everybody <laughs> staying on. But no, I'll get started. So, the Communist Party has a rich and long history in Britain. But we're not just a party of the past, we're a party for the future as well. We look at Scotland and we see um, a democracy, but the question is a democracy for who? A democracy of what? A democracy to experience low pay, a democracy to experience the chances of hunger, precarity, job losses and redundancy. The Communist Party stands in resolute against this with the interests of the working class at its heart. We're the only party that can't be bought because our interests are intertwined, and I cannot stress it enough, with working people in Britain. So if you want to find out more about how to, target, to, to create a better future and tackle this crisis together as a class, as the working class, check out the party's policies and the party's programmes online. Check out Britain's Road to Socialism and check out the Scottish Manifesto on the Communist Party's website. And to show your support, the last thing I can say is when it comes to Poland Day, make sure you vote and you vote communist. Thanks for that, Daniel. Um, all it is to, s to finish up now is just to thank um, our, our four participants for coming on tonight and going around clockwise, starting at the top left. We had John Stanley for the Alliance for Unity Party. We had Daniel Lamb of the Scottish Communist Party. Then down the bottom right corner, we had Don Allen of the Scottish Lib Dem Party. And then bottom left corner, we had Paddy Hogg of the Saving Scotland Party. So th thanks for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and I'm just going to sign off now. So that was the hustings. Um, it was exciting. It was an hour and a half long. Um, we have another hustings on tomorrow night where we have more guests on. Um, where, If I just pull that up, who we've got on tomorrow night. We've got quite a few people on tomorrow night. And... It was it was informative, I thought. Um, Godwin's Law was uh, invoked at the end, but uh, we'll keep going on. But for tomorrow night, we have... Do, 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 oh, you know what? You can check it on the website. Uh, but we do have um, an SNP candidate on tomorrow night, so maybe some. Uh, if you've got any questions for the candidates that are coming on tomorrow night, just message the page. Uh, if we get them before 5 o'clock, we'll put them towards the candidates in this last section of it. So until tomorrow, I will just say good night.